let's meet the Beatles. I've got Paul and, and John. John. And Paul's talking to George and Ringo. Well, I said in my intro, and you were listening to it, that there have been a lot of changes since this time last year. Mm. Well, we've seen them, you know, we've seen you making films and doing all sorts of marvellous things, but what have the changes meant to you? Um, 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 uh, nothing really. I think the main changes are, are in people's attitude, attitudes to you. How? I don't know. Um, but it's, it's people who change rather than you. You know, we feel exactly the same, really. Got a new suit, though. <laughs> <laughs> but you've made a film since then. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. just finished it. Yeah. Uh, why did you make a film? Well, it's a logical step, isn't it? And it, I believe it's quite lucrative, I believe. Anyway, someone asked us. You know, yeah, we were asked to do it, and we said, yeah. And Alan Owen wrote it, and we changed it, and we're all... It's called happy. A Hard Day's Night. Hard Day's Night. At your local night. cinema now. Not now. Not, not now. now. Soon. Yes. What difference is there since last June up to now? What sort of things have happened to you since then? The main difference is that we've got more money <laughs> and uh, less time to ourselves. You know, everything's speeded up and we're just running around like mad. If you ever manage to get away from the crowds, what sort of things do you like to do? Um, sleep, uh, see films, go to nightclubs, drive my car, and that's it. Do you find any difficulty in keeping up your public image? Just No. What image? <coughs> it's our image is just us. You know, as we were, we didn't try and um, make an image. It just happened, and so we don't have to keep it up. We just remain ourselves, don't we, Ringo? Well, like we do, I mean, because don't the other two were worried about it. <laughs> October 26th, the Beatles collect their MBEs from the Queen at Buckingham Palace. Ringo, how do you feel about going to the palace in a morning suit and all that? I don't mind, you know. It's all right. When I buy one. You you, you haven't got one? No, not yet. Oh. I've got an evening suit. That'll do. I don't think it will. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just go on my pajamas then. On June 11th, the Beatles were awarded the MBE. The Beatles were nominated for the award by Prime Minister Harold Wilson, who was also a member of Parliament for Highton Merseyside. It was widely seen as an attempt by Wilson to appear in touch with the younger generation, although at the time the voting age was 21. Well, gentlemen, first of all, many congratulations on your MBE. The whole country seems very delighted indeed, but how do you feel about it, Paul? Delighted indeed? You know, I'm glad everyone's delighted. I, I love it. Uh, but, I mean, is it fun for you? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, it'd be fun for you, wouldn't it? You know, we yeah, just woke up would. one morning and he said, <laughs> You know, it's great. <laughs> Ringo, how did you first hear about it? Um, well, we heard about it six weeks ago when we got the forms to fill in. And then we, we knew that we were going to get it two days ago. Officially. How did these forms come? Well, straight through the post or when they found another <laughs> one? I don't know, just in brown envelopes. Yeah, they were delivered by somebody, you know, by hand, I think, one of Brian's secretaries. I'll tell you. Or I'll they, tell were, you. Had it yeah. <laughs> they were sent from the Prime Minister of Downing Street to our manager's office, and they were delivered from there to Twickenham, where we were filming. And then, filming about the, the day later, we just found them, and we thought we were being called up to the army. And then we opened them, and we found out we weren't. We were all said that line. I know, but this is at ITV, the other one. July 19th, the Beatles released the title song to their second feature film, Help. The Beatles' second film, Help, had its royal premiere at the London Pavilion, Piccadilly Circus, London. 10,000 fans gathered outside to see the group arrive in a black Rolls Royce. Inside the pavilion, they met Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden, who had delayed their summer holiday for the event. August 6th saw the release of the Beatles' fifth UK album, Help. Saturday, August 14th, the Beatles had wowed US television audiences during their first three appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show, recorded in February 1964 during their first American visit. On this day, they made a fourth and final appearance. August 27, the meeting of two great musical acts of the 20th century took place, The Beatles and Elvis Presley. The meeting took place at Presley's Mansion at 565 
Perugia Way, Bel Air, Los Angeles. The Beatles arrived at 11 p.m. and were greeted by Elvis in his large circular living room. The room was bathed in red and blue light and contained a color television, jukebox, crescent-shaped couch, games tables, and a bar. September 25th saw the start of the Beatles cartoon series. It ran until 1969 on the ABC network with 39 episodes produced over three seasons. The Beatles' sixth UK album, Rubber Soul, was released on December 3rd. It had advance orders of more than 500,000 and entered the album charts on December 11th, 1965 and spent nine weeks at the top from the 25th of December. It remained in the charts for 42 consecutive weeks. With a new year came new experiences for the Beatles. On the 5th of January in 1966, following their record-breaking concert at New York's Shea Stadium on the 15th of August in 1965, it was decided that extra recordings would be needed if the footage was to be released to the public. The concert performance suffered as the Beatles couldn't hear themselves against the screams of 55,600 fans and the mobile recording facilities had left the sound quality of the recordings below standard. The film of the Beatles' 15th August 1965 concert at New York's Shea Stadium had its world premiere on BBC One in the UK on March 1st. There were more problems for the Beatles in the London Standard newspaper that March. John Lennon states, we're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. This statement was republished around the world. Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right and I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. John Lennon quoted in the London Evening Standard, March the 4th. Words which roused the Protestant fury of the American South as the Beatles began their tour of the States. In Chicago, Lennon apologized. Well, originally I was, up, I was pointed out that fact in reference to England. That we meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I wasn't knocking it or putting it down, I was just saying it as a fact. And it sort of, it is true, especially more for England than here. No, you... I'm not saying that we're better or greater, or comparing us with Jesus Christ as a person, or God as a thing, or whatever it is. You know, I just said what I said, and it was wrong, or was taken wrong, and now it's all this. Well, hi, everybody. This is Tommy Charles on the air here at WAQI Radio in Birmingham, Alabama. We've got music for you on a beautiful Thursday afternoon. This is where the trouble all began, here in the tiny top floor studio of station WAQY, wacky radio to the three quarters of a million citizens of Birmingham, Alabama. Disc jockey and station manager Tommy Charles read in date book magazine John Lennon's reported remarks on Christianity, remarks that had gone almost unnoticed in the five months since they were first published in Britain. Charging that Lennon's remarks were absurd and sacrilegious, Charles banned Beatles records from his programs and decided to build a mammoth bonfire to consume the group's records and souvenirs. Tommy, why this violent reaction to what John Lennon said? Well, I wouldn't call exactly what I have uh, done a violent reaction. However, uh, the Beatles for a long time have been able to, because of their tremendous popularity throughout the world, especially with the younger set, have been able to uh, say whatever they wanted to without any regard for judgment or maturity or the wisdom of it. And no one yet has challenged them to any tremendous degree where it might count or where they might feel it. What difference has all this round made to this tour, do you think? Any at all? Paul? Um, I don't think it's made much difference. It's made it more hectic. It's made all the press conferences mean a bit more. People said to us, you know, last time we came, all our answers were a bit flippant. And they said, why isn't it this time? And the thing is, the questions are a bit more serious this time. It hasn't affected any of the bookings. The bookings have been, uh, I mean, the, the people coming to the concerts have been the same, except for the first show in Memphis, which was a bit down, you know, but uh, so what? The disc jockey, Tommy Charles, who started this row off, has said that he won't play your records until you've grown up a little. How do you feel about that? 
Well, I don't mind if he never plays them again. You see, this is the thing, you know, everyone seems to think, and when they hear us say things like this, that we're so childish, you know. I mean, you can't say things like that unless you're a silly little child. But and if he was grown up, he wouldn't have done the thing, because he only did it for a stunt anyway. So, I mean, who is he to say about growing up? Who is he? Who is this guy? Who is Just he? Who? Apart from that, it's great. Having a swinging tour. Do you feel that Americans are out to get you, that this is all developing into something of a witch hunt? No, we thought it might be that kind of thing. I think a lot of people in England did, because there's this thing about, you know, when America gets violent, gets very hung up on a thing, it tends to have this sort of Blue Cox Clan thing around it. It seems to me you've always been successful because you've been outspoken and direct and forthright and all this sort of thing. Does it seem a bit hard to you that uh, people are now knocking you for this very thing? It does. Yes, Richard. It seems very hard. It seems hard. It seems hard. It, you know, free speech. But is it possible just to say what you think all the time? What about 14-year-old teenagers who think you're absolutely marvellous and can't well, bear to be hurt? You see, we're, we're not, when we say anything like that, we don't say it uh, as... A, uh, older people seem to think uh, to be offensive. We mean it, helpfully, you know, and if it's wrong what we say, okay, it's wrong and people can say, you know, you're wrong about that one. But in many cases we believe it's right, you know, and we're quite serious about it. But w do you mind being asked questions, for example, in America, people keep asking you questions about Vietnam. Does this seem useful? Well, I don't know, you know, if you can say that war is no good and a few people believe you, then it may be good, I don't know. You can't say it too much, though, that's the trouble. It seems a bit silly to be in America and for none of them to mention Vietnam as if nothing was happening. But why should they ask you about it? You're successful yeah, entertainer. That is why they, you know, because Americans always ask uh, yeah. showbiz people what they think about it. So do the British, you know. Showbiz, you know how it is. But, I mean, you've just got to... You can't just keep quiet about anything that's going on in the world unless you're a monk. Sorry, monks, I didn't mean it. I meant actually. <laughs> in April, the Beatles spent most of the month recording. By May, they were busy making Yellow Submarine. On the 30th of June, the Beatles were in Japan touring, later going on to the Philippines on July 4th. The release of the album Revolver came August 4th, alongside the single Eleanor Rigby from the film Yellow Submarine. The Beatles' second double A-side entered the UK singles charts on the 11th of August, 1966, and seven days later, it hit the number one spot. On August 29th at Candlestick Park in San Francisco, the Beatles performed their last ever concert. The group knew it was to be their final show. Recognizing its significance, John Lennon and Paul McCartney took a camera onto the stage, with which they took pictures of the crowd, the rest of the group, and themselves at arm's length. September 19th, John Lennon starts filming How I Won the War for Richard Lester. It's only funny if he does it eight times. But I, what, I don't see any reason why you can't even keep pull up the dialogue over the plane, that plane shot. And we could not have that shot at all. I like it. Well. Now, John on his own, playing the part of someone else, someone who is similar in character to himself, someone who he understands, but in fact a fictional part, a man who has nothing to do with the 60s, a man who, 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 was, who was 20 years old in 1940, um, with none of the, the pop elements, none of, none of the, the fans, none of, none of the persona of, of a 1966 man. I think that's a good step forward because he can then if that works, and I'm not one to predict, it's for the audience to say whether they consider that successful. It's, it's a fairly reasonable transition for all of them to play the parts of um, other people. You've been working with them over the past two or three years. Now the stimulus of the great pop explosion is gone. Is there a certain sense of, sort of dying away of enthusiasm and sort of running down the group? Of a dying away of their own enthusiasm? Yes. I don't think so. I think their enthusiasms are now being channeled into other areas, like composing for films, like um, writing, like appearing from time to time as actors, like, like searching for what they want to do. McCartney himself, I think, said he'd, he'd hate to be a 30-year-old Beatle, which gives him um, four or five years now. Um, last in terms of, of, of people who come together and make records over the next few years, I think certainly as people who 
come together perhaps once a year and make a film. And that's possible. On the 7th of November, he meets Yoko Ono for the first time while Paul McCartney has the idea for Sgt. Pepper on November 19th. On December 9th, the release of a collection of oldies album. It contained eight tracks that had previously appeared on UK albums and a further eight singles tracks which were issued on LP. Just one song, Bad Boy, was previously unreleased. This made the album an essential purchase for 1966 Beatles Completus, although it was less value for money for other fans. January 1967 saw various projects come and go. A new script by Joe Orton was rejected. The recording of Strawberry Fields, When I'm 64, Penny Lane, and Carnival of Light. In February, they started recording Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. By March, they went on to A Day in the Life, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, Lovely Rita, Getting Better, She's Leaving Home, With a Little Help from My Friends, and Being the Benefit of Mr. Kite. April 19th, the Beatles and Company are formed. This company would later be Apple. It's a business concerning records, films, and electronics. And as a sideline, whatever it's called, manufacturing, whatever. So we want to set up a system whereby people who just want to make a film about anything don't have to go on their knees in somebody's office, probably yours. By April 25th, the Beatles are recording Magical Mystery Tour, which continues through to May. On June 1st, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album is released. Sgt. Pepper entered the UK charts on the 3rd of June in 1967. The following week, it was at number one, where it remained for 23 weeks. It returned to the top spot for another week on the 25th of November, for two weeks from the 23rd of December, and for a final week on the 3rd of February in 1968. In all, it spent 148 consecutive weeks in the charts. Sgt. Pepper sold more than 250,000 copies in the UK in its first week of release, and by the end of June had sold over half a million. It remains in the top 10 best-selling albums of all time, both in the UK and worldwide. Day in the Life was just, I mean, the musicians were just told, you know, you start on this note here and just play anything you want. That was sort of like foreign to them. I mean, that and All You Need Is Love stick in my mind as, you know, the two, two of the most amazing days at Abbey Road, you know. I mean, All You Need Is Love had a lot of, so much pressure on all of us for, for uh, getting through this song without a problem, you know, because there was however many million people watching, you know. Yeah, I might get this the wrong way around, but what happened, we'd recorded Strawberry Fields and John was sort of happy with it, but we could tell by his face, Foley wasn't really happy with it. So about two, two weeks later, he came and said, you know, I want to re-record Strawberry Fields again. And he said, I want it more aggressive and, and like aggressive, you know, orchestral instruments at the end and, and stuff. So we re-recorded it. And then I think it was the day after we'd finished it, he came in and said, you know, I really like the first half of the first version we did and the second half of the, the new version. And the problem was they were two different tempos and they were different keys. Um, so we, George and I put our, our heads together on this and, and thought, well, what, what we had to, so we, we mixed both versions and we had a, a third machine to re record what we were going to do onto this, 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 this third quarter inch machine. So on the first machine, I had to gradually speed up, I might get, I've got this the wrong way around, gradually speed up the first half to marry the tempo and the, the key of where it enters the second half. And I think I had that on the second one on very speed. And then when, when I, where the edit point was going to be, I then gradually sped up or slowed down the, sec, the sec, second, second version. Um, so the only way I could uh, do it was to do, uh, we, as I said before, we didn't use razor blades for editing there. And we had little brass scissors. Um, so I did uh, a little, instead of a 45 degree cut, I couldn't do that because I knew it would, would jump. So I sort of snipped a long sort of crossfade cut on the quarter inch. 
uh, and, and that's what I did, and it, and it actually actually worked. But I mean, I'm making it sound a lot sort of simpler than it really was. But <laughs> but, but, I mean, but I mean, I mean, I mean, today you could just you know press a couple of buttons and you've done it, and which is you know. But I guess in a sense this has been like a like a pioneer, I, I suppose. We we were, we were virtually doing the impossible because it wasn't. No one else would have. You know, they would just would have you know poo pooed it off. I mean. In the Beatles vocabulary, there was no words such as no, you can't, or, or the word no. Um, there was always a way round uh, of find, finding uh, an answer to, to their, their, their questions, you know, or, which, which was good for us because, you know, we, we tried to, to, to give them our answers to whatever they wanted to do. It was a team. I mean, it was a team of people. Chef and I had a, we had a great relationship. And we like to have a laugh, you know, and Jeff would do something and he'd look across to me, you know, and if I was laughing or I was sort of putting my thumb up and, or we'd, I'd be flanging something and it would work really well, you know, and, and they wouldn't necessarily notice what was going on, you know. And George Martin wouldn't necessarily say anything or he'd say, oh, oh honestly, Richard, that's too much, you know. And uh, but Jeff would go, yeah, it's great, you know. And, and then it would be a combination of John and Jeff and I saying, great. And then, well, sorry, we've won, the, we've won that battle, you know. So it was a kind of a team thing, which is why I insist that everybody buys the mono pepper, not the stereo version, because the mono is the one where we were all there uh, um, uh, of their, their material really was like, Paul was like always to me the romantic and John was the aggressive one. And it was the combination of the, of the, of the two, two, two people that made, made these, these great sort of, re, you know, re records. It was, because um, all, all they really came into the studio with, with was a, ly a lyric. There was no like real demos. And they didn't. They had an idea of how they would do it inst with what instrumentation they do the song with. So we might spend four or five hours with guitar, piano, or what, electric guitar, piano, or, or and something else, and and Ringo doing some sort of rhythm pattern. And we might spend four or five hours doing that and realizing it was probably getting nowhere, and realizing that that instrumentation was the wrong instrumentation for the song. So that would get changed maybe into acoustic guitars and harpsichord or organ. And rhythm had, and, and Ringo had cha change his rhythm pattern, um, and, and then we'd that would be the accepted way of, of the way the song was to be done. And often, when you're, you're doing that, mistakes happen, and in the arrangement, and sometimes those mistakes are really good. So we used to embellish those mistakes. So that's how some of those really um, I, I call them you know really great arrangements happen by by mistakes happening on on the run, run throughs of, of the construction of the, of the songs. So that's how basically all those songs were, 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 um, were, were made. And I had the luxury of time because it was taking time for the routining of those songs. Um, and, uh, you know, being, having the, being limited on the equipment we had, I, I, and it was also really hard to, to get, for instance, if there were two electric guitars involved and we're listening to one loudspeaker for mono, to get each guitar to go in its own place and its own plane with its own e e proper equalization and reverbs. If we, although we didn't use a lot of re reverbs or echoes, but I, I never really used that because I'm, I'm just listening to sounds and tonalities when I'm constructing these, these mi mixings of, 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 of the songs. And often I'd realize that maybe, you know, John's guitar sounded fine, but George's wasn't quite making it or vice versa. And I'd try and do what I could with the amplifier because of my equalization limitations. And then realize even that wouldn't work. So I used to just say to George or John, can you just use another guitar that's a bit brighter? I was never aware sometimes of what guitars they were even playing because I was just listening, you know? So that's, that's what used to happen on the guitar side. And sometimes it would take like two hours. And as I said, I had the luxury of time to actually get those two guitars to come out note for note in their own place from one loudspeaker. So it was it was really hard, but you know, rewarding at the same time. And that's how all that stuff was constructed. There's no real sounds that, that clutter or cover other sounds.
but that, as I said, that was having the luxury of, of time. You know, and, and speaking of the luxury of time, you know, once again, me as being a fan, and the idea that so they they had stopped touring so that they could spend more time in the studio, and because they were the biggest band in the world, I guess the the other person that I remember hearing that is Brian Wilson got to spend oh, a lot of oh. time in the studio, and I know they were very influenced by Pet Sounds and everything. So the, that's another point where I think uh, the history of recording changed because you got to spend all this time yeah. and you were, you were trying to make them happy, which was probably impossible. Mm -hmm. But and, and like you said, they wouldn't take no for an answer on anything and you yeah. well. create, and, and when, when you listen, the idea of Revolver, of course, was amazing. Then Sergeant Pepper, the fact that that was, um, Four plus four, you're bouncing between four tracks, and you're having to commit the the EQ and mm -hmm. reverb and all that as you're putting down. And it's it's an amazing yeah. accomplishment. I think everyone here would acknowledge uh, who who are recording engineers who have a much easier way of accomplishing all that today. Yeah, I mean it was it was great fun, and as I said, extremely rewarding once you'd actually capture that. And we knew that when we were. I mean, I think on Mr. Kite on Pepper, we did four track to four track to four track. Um, but a lot of the, set, the sound effects across the benefit of Mr. Kite are being sent from stereo machines because we didn't have any more tracks on the four tracks because the master's still going to end up on one four track to, 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 to um, let, you know, let, lay, lay stuff on. Now, speaking for the, the benefit of Mr. Kite, for those who have not heard this story, could you explain... Uh, sort of the organ calliope sounds and how you accomplish that? Well, but yeah, basically there was like, like some backwards uh, glockenspiels recorded and sped up. And also EMI had a, a, an extensive sound effects library with like brass bands and steam organs and all sorts of stuff that a guy called Stuart Elton used to collect. He was like the sound effects man, plus one of the finest recording engineers as well at EMI at that time. He used to do a lot of classical recordings and middle of the road recordings and he taught me a lot as well but Stuart was like the, 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 the curator of all the sound effects so we went up into the sound effects library and and copied the sound effects that we thought we'd need and chopped them all up into little bits and threw them up in the air and they all landed on the floor and then we stuck them all back together again and that was that if that answers your question and yeah I, no, I, no I think we did a similar thing for Yellow Submarine as well and I know on one occasion, I think it might have been Yellow Submarine on the brass band thing, we threw them all up in the air and I stuck them all back together and I stuck them all back together in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, all, it's all amazing. I mean, like now there's different ways of accomplishing that, but you, you were really kind of uh, yeah. sort of making this up on the fly. Yeah, and, and getting along. back, back to, to, to Mr. Clark again, the way, you know, John could only express himself in a, in a certain way. Uh, and um, he actually, his direction on Mr. Kite was he wanted to smell the sawdust on the floor. And that's, that's how he interpreted the way he wanted to hear that, by smelling the sawdust. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, we, we could spend like an hour just talking about Pepper, but I've got to uh, ask you about A Day in the Life, which is at, at the time, uh, uh, you know, hearing, hearing this as a kid, uh, and the things that had come before, you know, so Revolver gives you a little bit of prep for what's coming, but it was, it was beyond mind-blowing to hear uh, Sergeant Pepper at that point in time. And, um, but a day in the life, wow, what a... So could you kind of take us through yeah, how I you mean, accomplished yeah, that? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, going, going back to that, it was like one of the biggest moments of my life because, you know, from the very outset of the song, when John just ran through it in the, in the studio and I was down in the studio... And you know you could just feel the the, the magic in the, in the vocal on that. And of course, John, as I said, did not like the sound of his voice. He always wanted something added to it, which was the repeat echo. So it was actually re recorded with that repeat echo. Uh, so anyway, you know, we we went up back up into the control room and we were about to start recording the song in its basic form. And like shivers ran down your back from that vocal performance, you know. So there were gaps left in the in the song. We no one knew what was going to go into the gaps, and I, uh, I, I wanted to get on those dr drum breaks in, in the song, I wanted to get like a drum sound of drums that no one had ever heard before. So what I did, I took, again, being naive, I guess, in a sense, took the, the, the bottom skins off the tom-toms and put some D19s in glass jugs with towels wrapped around them un underneath the toms. The theory being that the attack comes from the top and the tonality comes from the bottom. 
Uh, so that's how I recorded the drums and no one, I mean, you have to go back to those days. No one had ever, ever heard drums sound like that. And it was just amazing. So when it, when it came to do the orchestral part, um, I think it was, uh, someone said to, to George Martin, uh, well, you know, we'd need a 90 piece orchestra to go in those gaps. And then George said, well, e EMI won't pay for that because they're still, EMI is still paying for the sessions. So then Ringo said, well, let's get a 45 piece orchestra and put it on twice. <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we um, and the, di the direction to the orchestra was, which took a long time to get through to them because they were classical musicians, was the score, I think was like 24 bars and you start on this note and you end up after the 24th bar on this note, but you do it in your own time, not listening to the musician next to you. And because they said, well, we can't do that. And I guess musicians then had to, they had to have the notes written. I mean, they, there was no way they were going to improvise themselves. So anyway, it was like a 20 minute discussion from George Martin to the orchestra and they're still saying, no, we can't do it. And George is saying, well, just don't listen to the person next to you, just in your own time, go from that note to that note. Someone's going to count the bars for you. You just reach that note whenever you want to, over 24 bars. So then, it, it, Plus the fact that that night they were asked to wear tuxedos and all these funny noses and funny glasses and all these weird not novelty things and stuff. So that added to the, 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 the tension. Then, <laughs> then, 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 Paul, then, Paul, then Paul had a discussion with them about, now oh, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you know. And it, they were, it was, this is like, like 35 minutes after they were supposed to be doing this. Um, and the, luckily there was David Mason who'd played the, 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 the piccolo trumpet on Penny Lane and Alan Civil who'd done the French horn on For No One, who were principal brass players within, the, I think it was the Philharmonic or the Philharmonia Orchestra at that time. And he said, no, come on lads, we, we can do this because, you know, they played on, on a couple of the singles and what, what was actually trans, what was happening in front of our eyes now was the fact this barrier between the classical people and the pop people was gradually being broken down slightly, and it was. From that night, it was broken down. So anyway, we, we, did, we did start to, to, to do the recording, and they did eventually do the one note to the, the, the second note in the 24 bars with Mal Evans counting with the alarm clock going off to alert them that the 23rd bar was coming up, so the, the 24th bar was the next bar. Uh, so what we actually did on, on that as well, we, for the first time we tried to lock two four-track machines together. And the way we did that was to actually pulse both motors with a 50-cycle pulse. But there was no sort of lockable way of doing it, so we had to put a grease mark on the... Because we laid down the, uh, the, the first orchestral recording on track four of the, the master four-track. So then we put a grease pencil mark on both machines, put this one into play and this one into record and did another pass on the orchestra, and then we did another three passes on the orchestra without them knowing. Eventually, they did know that we'd actually recorded them five times, and they actually did get paid for that. But they, uh, that night, they did not know what we'd done. So, anyway, so um, where, the, the, uh, where the piano chord comes in on the end, that came about two weeks later when uh, Paul had an idea the night we'd done the orchestra to, uh, to put this sort of om sort of sound, which would have been where the piano is. And it didn't work because there was a lot of invited guests like the Rolling Stones and some of the monkeys were there, I believe, and a few other people um, to add to the festivities while all this orchestral thing's going on. There is a, 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 a 16 mil film that flies around on, the, on, on YouTube, I think, sometimes of the, of the session. So when I, Richard and my, myself that night, we set up a monitor mix and the control room, it was done in number one, uh, Abbey Road, and the control room was quite small. And the, so a couple of the Rolling Stones were in the back of the control room, and, and Ron Richards, who was the producer of the Hollies, was sitting on the floor by the mixing console. And so Richard and I played it back, and it was like the most amazing thing you've ever heard in your life, and there was absolute silence at the end of the playback. And Ron had his head in his hands, and he said, I'm going to give the business up. You know, and this is the guy that produces the Hollies, and he was really serious. And if, if you'd have been there that night, you would have realised what we'd actually listened to. And it was like going from a, a square black and white picture to Cinemascope Technicolor. It was just amazing. It really was. 
with seemingly unstoppable momentum during the summer of 1967. On the 18th of May, the Beatles sign a contract to represent the BBC and Britain on Our World, the world's first live television satellite link-up to be seen by approximately 400 million people across five continents. The Beatles' appearance was announced four days later, on May the 22nd. John Lennon wrote the song, All You Need Is Love, especially for the occasion, to the brief given by the BBC. It had to be simple so that viewers around the world would understand it. Our World took place on the 25th of June in 1967. Between the announcement and the broadcast date, the Beatles recorded the rhythm track and some basic vocals. Over the next few months, the Beatles kept busy, recording and traveling. But late on Sunday, the 27th of August in 1967, sudden news rocked the Beatles' world. Their manager, Brian Epstein, was found dead at his home in Chapel Street, London. The Beatles were in Bangor in North Wales when word came through that their manager, Brian Epstein, had died. John, where would you be today without Mr. Epstein? I don't know. Are you, are you driving down to London tonight? Yes, somebody's taking us down here. You heard the news this afternoon, I believe. Yes. And Paul's already gone down? Yes. I see. What, you've no idea what your plans are for tomorrow? No, no, we'd just go and find out, you know. And just have to play everything by ear. Yes. I understand that Mr. Epstein was to be initiated here tomorrow. Yes. Mm. When, when was he coming up? Was he coming up in coming the afternoon? Tomorrow, just Monday, that's all we knew. Had you told him very much about the spiritual regeneration movement? Well, as, as much as we'd learned about spiritualism and various things of that nature, then we'd tried to pass on to him and he was equally as interested as we are, as everybody should be. He, he wanted to know about life as much as we do. Had you spoken to him since your uh, since, since you became interested mm. this weekend? No. no. I spoke to him uh, Wednesday evening, the, the evening before we first uh, uh, saw Maharishi's lecture, and he was in great spirits. And when did he tell you that he'd like to be initiated? Well, when we arrived here on was it, I think Friday, we got a telephone call later that day to say that Brian would follow us up and be here Monday. Do you intend uh, returning to Bangor before the end of this conference? We probably won't have time now because uh, Maharishi will only be here till about Thursday and we'll have so much to do in London that we'll, we'll have to meet him again some other time. I understand that um, this afternoon uh, Maharishi uh, conferred with you all. Could I ask you what, he, what advice he offered you? He told us that, uh, not to get overwhelmed by grief and to whatever thoughts we have of Brian to keep them happy because any thoughts we have of, have of him will travel to him wherever he is. Had he ever met uh, Mr. Epstein? No, but he was looking forward to meeting him. Four days later, after the death of Epstein, the Beatles issued a statement about the future of their management company, NEMS Enterprises. The group revealed that they would continue to be managed by NEMS until further notice, but that Clive Epstein, Brian's brother, would not be their personal manager. No one could replace Brian, Paul McCartney was quoted as saying. The filming of the Beatles' Magical Mystery Tour started Monday, September 11th. It was mostly done in two weeks. The story was basic and traditional for pop package tours, involving several bands to begin at London's Allsop Place, near to Baker Street Underground Station. Paul McCartney decided that the mystery trip should start at the same location at 10.45 a.m. The coach, however, was still being decorated with the Magical Mystery Tour lettering and colors. The passengers included family, friends, fan club staff, actors, and other selected travelers who were made to wait two hours for its arrival. In October, the Beatles continued to film Magical Mystery Tour, plus attend the premiere of John Lennon's film, How I Won the War. November was filled with more recording time. On December 1st, the Beatles launched the Apple Boutique at 94 Baker Street in London, which later closed on the 31st of July in 1968. More than two weeks before its accompanying film received its premiere on BBC television, the Beatles' Magical Mystery Tour EP was released. The package came with a gatefold sleeve and a 28-page book including lyrics. This retailed at twice the normal price of a single. Having been edited to 55 minutes from nearly 10 hours of footage, 
The Beatles television film Magical Mystery Tour had its world premiere on BBC One at 8.35 on December 26, 1967. The film was generally perceived to be the Beatles' first artistic failure. The Magical Mystery Tour film was disliked by critics and viewers alike. In an effort to explain the group's creation, Paul McCartney gave a television interview to David Frost the next day. January 22, 1968. Apple opens offices at 95 Wigmore Street in London. The Beatles opened their offices on the fourth floor of the building and spent a great deal of time in the building during the first part of 1968. Unfortunately for the Beatles, Apple's staff were unable to play records during office hours in case they disturbed the other tenants in the building. This was one of the reasons why they relocated to 3 Seville Row on the 15th of July, although some parts of Apple remained based at Wigmore Street until their lease expired. In February, John Lennon and George Harrison traveled to India. The trip had been due to take place in the summer of 1967, but was postponed following the death of Brian Epstein. The Beatles had chosen instead to press on with the making of Magical Mystery Tour. They were later joined by Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. The Beatles remain in India through March and part of April, except Ringo, who decides to come back to London. In May, John Lennon and Paul McCartney travel to New York to promote Ample, their new company. On June 18th, the National Theatre's stage version of John Lennon's book, In His Own Right, directed by Victor Spinetti, had its debut at the Old Vic Theatre on London's Waterloo Road. The play was the idea of dramatist Adrian Kennedy, who co-wrote it with Spinetti. They based it on Lennon's first book and the follow-up, A Spaniard in the Works. It featured a character, me, played by Ronald Pickup, whose thoughts and ideas were followed throughout the play. Lennon's arrival with Yoko Ono caused much fuss amongst journalists and reporters present. Although the pair had first appeared in public some weeks earlier, the news of Lennon's marriage ending was still largely unknown. Well, an awful lot of the, uh, of the play is about radio and TV. Well, I mean, that's, what, that's all I ever heard, didn't I? Yeah. I mean, you go home... Comic and... books? Yeah. Like the church? Your comic books. Your church. Your classic comics. Yeah, your classic comics. Your Zenos. Your school. Ah, your school, your pub and your TV and your radio. Exactly. Well, that's it. The funny thing, you didn't put in pop music. No, because up until then, it hadn't hit me. Up this till is, uh, this is pop music didn't hit me until I was yeah, 16, and this is all before the things that happened before 16. Really. But it's not, it's not really John's childhood. It's all of ours, really, isn't it? Now? It is. We're all one. No, but I mean, isn't we're it, all you know, one, aren't we? No, it is, you know. July 17th was the world premiere of the animated feature film, Yellow Submarine. Although the group had largely retreated from the public eye in recent months, with their trip to India and the recording of the White Album, their popularity remained undiminished. As with their previous film openings, large crowds turned out, blocking streets and bringing traffic to a standstill. The same day that the Apple Boutique closed, the Beatles were recording Hey Jude. September 31st, August 22nd. Cynthia Lennon sues John for divorce. John Lennon had previously filed for divorce, alleging that Cynthia had herself been adulterous, a charge she denied. This was the same day as Ringo quits the Beatles. Tensions had been building within the Beatles for some time during the recording of the White Album. On this day, matters came to a head, and Ringo Starr left the group. Hey Jude gets released in the U.S. on August 26th. On September 3rd, Ringo rejoins the group. John and Cynthia's divorce decree would later go through Friday, November 8th. November would also see the release of the White Album. January 1969, a new year for the Beatles. It saw the recording of the Let It Be sessions. By January 10th, George Harrison had quit the group, only to rejoin on the 15th. Later that month, on January 30th, they do a rooftop concert at the Apple Building. February 3rd, Alan Klein is appointed the Beatles manager. On March 12th, Paul McCartney marries Linda Eastman at Marylebone Register Office. When did you decide to get married, Paul? About a week ago. What prompted it? Uh, just, you know, so we decided to do it instead of thinking about it. Linda, how, how do you feel about it all? You, you're obviously terribly happy. How are you feeling this morning? Terribly happy. That sounds good enough. <laughs> Unquote. Uh, Linda, you've been described as a New York socialite. Does this mean you'll be spending much of your time in New York? No. Where will you be living? In London. In London. Paul, what about you? How do you feel to be the father yes, to a six-year-old? Yes, I'll be living in London. You'll be living in London. How about... 
being the father to a six-year-old child. It's terrible. It's terrible. I hate it. I hate it. And it's going to be a terrible burden. I do. It's horrible. Many of your the fans, the girls who've been waiting outside the house and outside the hotel today, seem to be more than upset about this. What do you feel? Um, I don't know what I feel about that, you know. On this day, the Beatles took part in their penultimate photo session together. It took place in two locations, with three photographers taking pictures of the group. The first location was at the Mattingly Club on Willoughby Road in East Twickenham in London, followed by more shots taken at Number 4 Ducks Walk, where they boarded a boat on the River Thames. The Beatles and the photographers took three vehicles to the location, John Lennon's Rolls Royce, a white Mercedes, and a Humber Snipe. The first photographs were taken with the Beatles leaning against the Rolls Royce, with the Toms behind them. A crowd soon gathered, and the Beatles obligingly signed autographs. Afterwards, the group moved to the second location, where they were photographed climbing into a rowing boat, the Fritz Otto Maria Anna. They rowed to a small island in the middle of the river, from which they waved to the camera on the riverbank. Nearly a month after its release in the United Kingdom, on May 5th, the Beatles' first single of 1969 was issued in the United States, Get Back with Don't Let Me Down as its B-side. It was credited to the Beatles with Billy Preston. It was the only time such a credit featured on a Beatles release. On June 1st, John Lennon and Yoko Ono record Give Peace a Chance, which will get released on July 4th. On June 4th, the Beatles would release The Ballad of John and Yoko. August 22nd is the Beatles' final photo shoot. September 8th, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison meet to discuss their future. The Beatles had recently finished recording Abbey Road in early September 1969, but they still had much business to deal with. On the 8th of September 1969, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison met at the Apple Corps headquarters at 3 Seville Row, London, to discuss their future. Lennon's assistant, Anthony Fawcett, brought a portable tape recorder to document the meeting, which also allowed the absent Ringo Starr to hear the discussions. At the time, Starr was in the hospital, undergoing tests for an intestinal complaint. How long do you think you can go on being a practicing beaker? It depends how I feel and how they feel when it happens. I mean, there comes a time when it's time for a beaker product, and we always make that decision whether to make it or not, you know. Because uh, sometimes we go through hell recording, sometimes we don't, you know. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's not worth it. And now, the problem now is, of in the old days, when we needed an album, Paul and I got together and produced an album, or produced enough songs for it. Nowadays, there's four of us, three of us writing prolifically, and trying to fit it on one album. And it's not like we're, we're wrestling in the studio trying to get a song on. We all do it the same way, you know. It's, we take it in turns to record a track, you know. But, but it, usually George lost out, you know, because Paul and I are tougher. You know, but it's not where it gets to, we don't want to fight about it, you know. Now, half the track's on Abbey Road, I'm not on something. You know, half the track's on a double album, and, and way back, it, it depends. We're not, we're not always on, there's sometimes only two Beatles on a track. But it's uh, got to the situation, if we have the name Beatle on it, it sells, you know. And when we begin to think like that, then there's something wrong, you know. Then you begin to get... Uh... Well, then you begin to think, uh, what are we selling? During the following months, Paul McCartney was writing and producing various other artists. Ringo was attending the premiere of his new film, The Magic Christian, co-starring Peter Sellers. George Harrison was also recording, while John Lennon was spending more time with Yoko Ono. 1970 was the start of a new decade and the end of the Beatles. Saturday, January 4th, recording Let It Be, the Beatles' last recording session as a group. Although there were two further recording sessions for the Let It Be album, involving just one member of the Beatles, this was their last time recording as a group, albeit without John Lennon. Having completed I, Me, Mine the previous day, the Beatles turned their attention to Paul McCartney's song, Let It Be. The U.S. release of the song was March 11th. On April 10th, 1970, Paul McCartney announces that the Beatles had split. With his debut solo album, McCartney due for release on the 17th of April, 1970, Paul McCartney chose not to do any promotional interviews. Instead, he asked Apple's Peter Brown to write a list of questions to which he supplied the answers. They included his ruminations on the Beatles and the end of his partnership with John Lennon. 
McCartney's self-interview caused an immediate storm after its contents were revealed by Daily Mirror journalist Don Short, and its contents were widely reported around the world. Although speculation had been rife for the previous six months, confirmation that the group was no more still came as a shock to many. Well, I'll get the transparencies to, to you, or to the studio, tomorrow afternoon. All right, fine. Okay, bye. Maybe they can get together every so often, making an LP for the sake of nostalgia or something, but I think Lennon and McCartney could very well become the Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, writing team for films and for musicals and for songs generally. I mean, there's any doubt about that. I think they're, they're not stuck in a rush of, of the Liverpool sound or beats or anything like that. And there's some of the recent records or recent songs have shown that. I think they're capable of great things in the writing field. Um, Ringo, I think <coughs> he could, um, with the right film part, I think he could possibly be quite a good comedy um, performer. Um, George? He enjoys it, anyway, not that much, I know. George? I don't know. I mean, um, I don't know. He'd probably open a string of Indian restaurants. Huh? Word. <laughs> Other people are going to go their own ways in 1967. They could be, you know, on our own or together. We're always involved with each other, whatever we're doing. You know. Could you ever see a time when, in fact, you weren't working together? I could see us working not together for a period, but we'd always get together for one reason or other. Like, I mean, you, you need other people for ideas as well, but, you know, and we all get along fine. Will you, will you, be, will you be doing films on your own next year? Uh, no, I don't want to make a career of it. I did it just because I felt like doing it. And some, um, Dick Lester asked me, and I said yes. And I wouldn't have done it if the others hadn't liked it. You know? yeah. They said fine, because we were on holiday anyway. Do the others have film ambitions on their own? No, nobody's particularly interested in it. I'm not all that mad on it. You know? What do you really want to do? I mean, do you I don't know, I just want to do a few things, you know. Yeah. You haven't really decided exactly what... No, I'll try a few things, you know, but I just found out a bit more about films doing that. You know. What's this, the songwriting team thing will keep going on, whatever happens, will it? Yeah, we'll probably carry on writing like music forever, you know, <laughs> whatever else we're doing. Because you, know. you just can't stop, you, you know, you find yourself doing it whether you want to or not. But you think the tours, like the American tours and the English one, you know, the well, stands in England? You know, there must be a point where they don't work anymore because they're not to do with what we're doing, record-wise or film-wise. In May, the album Let It Be was released, followed by a single, The Long and Winding Road. On the 20th of May, the feature film Let It Be had its UK premiere. Although the Beatles didn't attend, two notable figures from their past were present. Cynthia Lennon and Jane Asher were among the guests, two years after they split from John Lennon and Paul McCartney. On December 31st, 1970, Paul McCartney files a lawsuit to dissolve the Beatles' partnership. This was the history of the Beatles from A to Z.